On behalf of the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County, I'd like to welcome you to successful vegetable gardening growing year round in Santa Clara County. Tonight's session is part six of an eight part series. My name is Sharon Erickson. I'm a volunteer with the Master Gardener program here in Santa Clara County, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's session. The University of California Master Gardener program extends research-based information about home horticulture and pest management to the public. This course is geared towards residents of Santa Clara County, California, where we have warm, dry summers and cool, but not cold, wet winters. Well, normally they're wet, sometimes wetter than others, um, that allow us to grow vegetables year round. If you're from another area, you may find that some of our material may not apply directly to you. Planting times, local soil and climate conditions and common local pests will be, may or will be different in your area. If so, please know there are master gardener programs all over the US and Canada that can provide advice appropriate to where you live. On the other hand, as I've been saying in each of these sessions, what we're saying here tonight is true for a lot of it is true for vegetable gardeners everywhere. This, this eight part series began with a session on garden planning, followed by sessions on soil, seeds and seedlings, water and mulch, and managing pests. And tonight's session is on cool season vegetables. It'll be followed by two, se two sessions on warm season vegetables over the next two weeks. Your presenter for tonight's session on cool season vegetables is Candace Simpson. Candace has been a UC Master Gardener volunteer since 2003. Take it away, Candace. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, before the class, for those of you that have been uh, keeping up with our assignments and um, the uh, activities that we've asked you to do outside of the class, we asked you to look at the website, at the Master Gardener website to find a cool season vegetable that you would like to grow that you could plant now, that is in, in March, although we're really at the very end of March, and to look into its pests uh, by using the IPM website that Louise introduced you to last week in the IPM class. For those of you that did that, uh, if you have any questions about that assignment, if you had any questions about using the websites, what you read there, uh, please submit those in the Q&A uh, now, early, so that we can uh, sort through those and see if we can help you with that. It is a major goal of this series of classes that you will be comfortable using both the Master Gardener website and the UC IPM website because those are the places where you can uh, truly uh, see, uh, really help yourself with your gardening questions as a starter. So. All right, so tonight we're going to discuss cool season vegetables and we'll be talking about the advantages of growing in the cool season, uh, things to keep in mind to be successful in order in, in, in growing in the cool season and specific some information about specific cool season veggies. We cannot talk about all of them. If you look at our planting chart, you'll see that two thirds of the vegetables on that planting chart are cool season vegetables and only one third are warm season vegetables. So we are not going to repeat the information that is on our website because we know that that is accessible to you. Instead, I'm going to try to highlight some of the things that are perhaps non-intuitive or not as well known or that you might just have a harder time accessing so that you can be successful with the most popular vegetables that we grow during the cool season. Now it is true that we are rapidly exiting the cool season. Uh, you, uh, if you looked up what you could plant in March, here we are at the very last days of March. So you may or may not be able to follow through on something that you actually looked into this week. There are some cool season vegetables that can stay in place into, for the next few months, into the start of the warm season. And so that is, uh, if you see in our chart that you can plant something in May, certainly in April, but uh, sorry, in April, 
uh, or in March, you it's worth a try because you really won't be ready to put in your warm season vegetables for a little bit longer. So you may be able to get something in there that's technically a cool season vegetable, and it might be one that will last through the summer. We'll talk about that as we talk through all of them. Okay. So why garden year round? And we love this picture. Um, I think it's Minnesota, uh, which is where Karen, one of the other teachers is from. And this is what a house and yard might look like in Minnesota in the cool season. But in California, we are really fortunate. We can garden year round, have a, a garden that's bursting with vegetables in the cool season, straight through the winter, just as much as we can do that in the summer because of our Mediterranean climate. Lisa discussed the Mediterranean climate features in the class on irrigation, that warm, dry summer, cool, wet winter, maybe not as wet as we wanted this winter, but generally that's when we get our rain. So it is a very sustainable thing to do to maintain your garden through those cold weather months, those cool weather months at least. Uh, so you can, it's an efficient use of space. We have less water needs in the winter because we have more rain and there's definitely less pest control. You're probably experiencing right now a buildup of pests in your garden as the days get warmer. So I think you understand that in the winter, we really don't have, we don't worry about some of these pests that cause so many problems in other times of the year. So cool season vegetables tend to be leaves and roots and stems and flower buds. Um, they, there are really no fruits that we grow in the cool season except for peas. So peas and fava beans, I guess you could say. So it's a completely different set of vegetables than we grow in the warm season. And there are some real advantages to growing uh, in the cool season. For one thing, you don't need to refrigerate your vegetables. They're in a good chilling holding place out in the garden at the temperature that exists in the garden. So you can pick them fresh, eat them that day, and you don't have to worry about picking everything or storing it because it's going past prime. I've already mentioned that we use less water, there's fewer pests, and a lot of vegetables taste better in the winter. Uh, plants make more sugars in the cool weather in order to protect themselves from cold temperatures. And those sugars are what make vegetables taste delicious to us. So you can treat the garden like an outdoor refrigerator. There's less work because you don't have to do as much watering. You don't have to keep up with pests. Even weeds take a break in the heart of the winter. So uh, there are many, many reasons to go for this kind of, of gardening. There are a few things though that you do have to pay attention to that are different from what you're thinking about in the warm season. This slide is pointing out that the track of the sun in winter is quite different from that in summer. So in the summer, it crosses the sky in a very high arc and goes quite a bit, uh, quite, uh, quite a few degrees around the horizon in the process, but it's high in the sky. So shadows from fences, trees, houses, this pink block is meant to suggest maybe a, a building or maybe a fence. Um, the shadow will be covering less area on the ground than in the winter when the sun is traveling in a much lower and shorter arc in the sky. So that the sh shadow as you see there in the photo on the right is uh, much more stretched out, it covers more ground. So the same area that you plant in that you have full sun in in the summer, you may not have full sun in the winter. So you do have to be aware of that. We go from having almost 15 hours of sunlight here on the summer solstice to having just about nine and a half hours of sunlight on the winter solstice. So it's, it is the amount of sun and, and still vegetables need their six hours. Uh, minimum of six hours. So there are a few that can limp along um, with less, but yeah, you do need to think about sun position. Another thing to think about in order to be sustainable in your garden is irrigation. 
uh, and adjusting your irrigation when we have rain. So we do not want to continue to irrigate our gardens full time as we do in the summer when we're in the winter and we're having rain. At the same time, when the rains don't come, you need to be ready to turn that irrigation on. So the plants need the same kind of watering. The soil is losing less water because it's much, the ambient temperature is lower. So there's much less evapotranspiration from the surface of the soil. And the plants don't need to draw up as much water uh, as they would during a really warm day. But nevertheless, uh, there are adjustments that have to be made. And this is just a picture of that battery, type of battery operated timer that Lisa showed you in the irrigation class that can be used at a hose bin. But this is true for any irrigation system, whether it's a simple timer like this or an installed system. They all have some kind of a control for turning off uh, when the rains come. Uh, I think you can see here rain off. There's an off and on switch, obviously, so that you can turn the timer off altogether. But there's also a rain off uh, position that you can set the timer to. If, you're, if you have one of those smart controllers that Lisa talked about, uh, it will take care of this for you. But if, if you're uh, working with something like this or your own system that you have to adjust, uh, be sure and take, um, take precautions that you don't waste water. And the very, very important thing is that you plant your cool season garden at the right time. Many people hear cool season garden and think that that means that they're going to be planting in October or so. But as you can see from this slide, October is really too late for most of the vegetables that you're going to want to plant. And you'll see that also shown on our planting chart. So really these plants, whether it's you're planting from seed, cool season vegetables from seed, or you're planting transplants, they need to be planted in late summer, mid August, even early August for some of them, mid August, late August, early September, mid September, depending on your microclimate, it's, this is going to be at different times, but the main planting time for the, for the cool season, the bulk of the cool season is August, September. There are a few things that you can plant in October. I gave it one star here. Um, the, you can, if you have well-started seedlings, uh, nice and healthy ones, and if you're, you're still having a lot of warm weather, you can get them in the ground in early October and they will probably be okay. Seeds are very dicey in October. You'll remember from the seeds and seedlings class that germination requires warm soil. So planting seeds out directly in the soil in October is going to be chancy. It may not be warm enough for those plants and probably they won't be getting enough hours of sun for long enough to really grow quickly and produce in the fall. They might produce the following spring. November and December are really just here in this slide for alliums. Uh, just about the only thing you can plant then is alliums. Now, there are some vegetables like lettuce that we are going to plant successively so that we can have lettuce throughout the season. Uh, and if you have seedlings, you can put them in. You can certainly try to put them in in November and December. Uh, and, but they will grow very, very slowly if you put them in then because of the cold. So um, really it's good to plan to have your planting for your um, cool season garden, the main, main part of the season, which is basically October through February. Um, to do that, you want to plant in September and maybe a, skid a little bit into October. There is a second season though, uh, and that is where we are now and we're kind of finishing. So you see here, it talks about late winter, early spring, mid February to the end of March. So this is where we are. And we can plant many cool season vegetables again here because we're at the very end of that time again. Um, if you're going to plant things at this time of year, go for, uh, varieties that mature early so that they can get in there and get a quick start and you'll be able to harvest them in time to convert your garden over to summer vegetables. So if you're planting seeds, 
definitely go for things that are very quick growing like turnips and radishes. Um, carrots take longer. They do very well in early spring, but they will occupy the space. So if, you're, if you really have your heart set on using all of your garden space for um, the warm season vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, et cetera, then you're, gonna, you're going to want these cool season ones to come out. So go for short season, uh, short growing time uh, varieties at this time. And if you use transplants, that will give you a huge head start on getting something uh, going. I've planted transplants of lettuce and kale in, in my um, garden and they're producing already. I planted them in mid-February and they're producing. So, they're, but I would not put kale in now just because I know I'm not going to want it to stay in there that long. Okay, so here's uh, just, just the obligatory slide of our vegetable planting chart. This is such an important document for you to get to know how to use. And I just put it up here to show you that when you look at this chart, uh, you will see that there are vegetables that seem to have two uh, sessions of planting separated by a series of no's. And there are other vegetables that have one session of planting, one, one set of months of, for planting in the middle. Those are our warm season vegetables. So hopefully you have become uh, familiar enough with this chart now that I don't need to belabor that. Uh, I hope you will take a look at it and um, use it in all your garden planning in the future. A few other things that you uh, want to take care of or think about as you're planning, if, when you're planning cool season. And I think, um, do be thinking about, imagine it, that it's, you've had all your tomatoes, you've had all your cucumbers, you've had all your peppers, and you're, those, are, those are kind of winding down and you want to have a good cool season garden next fall. So if that is the case, one of the things that you need to think about is how am I gonna protect my seedlings, my cool season seedlings, when I put them in, if uh, the weather turns suddenly very hot. Suppose I plant some seedlings like these, I think these are broccoli. Uh, suppose you plant them um, and you get a really hot September day. You wanna know in advance how you're gonna protect them. Here you see row cover over hoops. We've talked about row cover in, in, uh, different, in other classes. Uh, very important uh, thing to have in your garden shed. And putting it hoops over the plants enables you to more easily get in and out. If, you're, if it's lying on the, on the plants, it's a little bit more of a production to pick it up and get in there and see your plants. Certainly by the time there, you can grow the plants under there for the entire time, but harvesting is a bit of a pain if the uh, row cover is lying on the plants. Uh, putting hoops is a, a nice way to improve that. Uh, here are a couple of other pictures of row cover uh, because there were quite a few questions about row cover last week uh, when Louise talked about it for pest control. So I wanted to, to uh, give you a little bit more information about it. You'll see that top picture. It's not actually covering the whole bed. It's only covering half the bed. I think that that is because they are using it there to just give a little sunscreen to newly planted seedlings. And that must be the uh, direction from which the hottest sun is coming. Uh, clearly it's not for pest control because it's not uh, covering them up altogether. And on the bottom picture, you see a, a row of mature vegetable plants that are completely covered by row cover. And you can see in the back there that it's actually um, pinned, pinned down to the ground, it looks here. So this might be for, oops, sorry. This might be for pest control uh, because they're trying to enclose these plants in it. And you can see what I mean about it being a little bit more difficult to harvest if this is what you're doing with your row cover. But uh, sometimes it's worth it to keep um, insects off your plants. Okay, uh, so uh, the other, another thing that you need to think about in the cool season is whether it's going to get too cold for any of the things that you have planted. If you follow the planting chart and you plant the, the uh, vegetables that we're gonna be talking about tonight, um, those vegetables are going to be okay. 
The question is whether there is frost protection needed for any cool season vegetables. So let me again emphasize that we are talking to primarily to folks who live in Santa Clara County, California. In our county, cool season vegetables, if they are well watered, they're just like any other plant, they need to be well watered in order to be frost resistant, but they can tolerate the light frost that we generally have here. So in Northern Santa Clara County, um, San Jose North and, and probably most of San Jose, the urban area, uh, we don't have frost lower than 28 degrees. A light frost is considered something above 28 degrees. So between 28 and 32, that's light. And we don't grow vegetables in the cool season here that anything you find on our chart, it is not going to be frost sensitive. Definitely, if you're trying to preserve warm season vegetables, they may very well be very frost sensitive. So we're not talking about those tonight. But our cool season vegetables that you see here in these tables are, are okay if a light frost is expected. If a hard frost is expected, 28 degrees or lower Fahrenheit, that is. There are some that you should protect with row cover. And um, in the valley below San Jose, frost temperatures lower than 28 degrees are, are uh, definitely to be expected at times. So please, if you wanna take a picture of that, you can, um, but that's a kind of a quick list of which vegetables need to be protected with row cover and which ones do not need to be protected if a hard frost is expected. You might be surprised to see spinach, which seems like kind of a tender green, uh, to be over there on the need not protect, but spinach is incredibly cold hardy and uh, does not need to protect it, uh, along with the others that you see over here. You can see that quite a few brassicas, the leafy brassicas, uh, that they're pretty, pretty sturdy. And in fact, they're, the, they're among the vegetables that taste better after a frost because of that sugar production that I mentioned. On the left, you have the ones that it would be good to protect with row cover, okay, if you're expecting a hard frost. Okay, I hope that if you got a, um, uh, that you got a picture of that if you feel like you want it. But remember that these um, talks are on, on our website, so you can always go find it there as well. I wanted to let you know, uh, people were asking, does row cover uh, protect enough from frost and does it cut the, the light down too much? And so I, I went to the web and I got the information on two weights of floating row cover. So if you want to buy this stuff, uh, what you're looking for online is floating row cover, that's the name. And there it comes in uh, weights, that will cover heavy frost, that will protect from heavy frost to weights that will not protect. Uh, so you can see here that these are the two that I tend to buy. <laughs> um, it's um, the one on the right is the lightest weight and it they will tell you online or in the catalog if you're looking at something how much light is transmitted and how much frost protection it will get give. So you see this one on the right, AG19 in this case, this, this make is it, it transmits 85% of the sunlight, which is quite high and sufficient. And it provides up to four degrees of frost protection, which is definitely more than we need in Northern Santa Clara County. The one on the left, is a medium weight row cover, which cuts down the light to 70% and provides, but provides more frost protection. You can get row cover heavy enough to protect from very, very heavy frost. So once you get online and find a, um, a supplier who has all these weights, you will be able to read about all the different options that are available. Uh, when you first look at it, don't faint from the price. It's sold to farmers in widths and lengths that can cover a whole field. 
So if you look at that by accident, you're going to see that it costs more than $1,000. But they do sell small quantities to home gardeners, uh, things that are like eight feet wide or 12 feet wide and 50 feet long or even less. So those are the, the kinds of packages that you're looking for. And uh, I always tell people that I feel like having a big roll of row cover in my garden shed is like having money in the bank. It makes me feel that I have whatever I need to protect anything that happens in the garden. Okay, um, so you might be looking at this and thinking, wait a minute, I didn't know you could do grow tomatoes in the cool season. Well, these are not cool season crops. These are all our summer crops. So uh, you see here, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, peppers, eggplants, some blackberries sneaked in there, some strawberries, uh, and there are two, and beans, and some chard in the back there. And there's some two lonely beets there in the front. So those beets were left over from my cool season spring garden. And I just let them continue. That's one of the vegetables that you can leave in the ground uh, and they will continue to size up in the summer. Um, but all the rest of these are warm season vegetables and you will notice that they're all the fruits of the vegetable plant. They're all the fruits, the botanical fruit of the vegetable plant. Um, all the cool season crops that we're gonna talk about tonight are lead, then none of them are the fruits, as I said, except peas and fava beans. Um, all of them are leaves, their stems, their roots, their uh, flower buds. So we eat a different part of the plant and it takes a lot of energy for a plant to make fruit. That's why some these summer crops where we're growing them for the fruits need a lot of uh, nutrition and they need a lot of warmth and sunlight in order to generate all the materials they need to get all the way through their life cycle to the final stage of fruiting and creating seeds. So uh, we are now gonna start to go through the, the ones that are our, um, our uh, cool season vegetables for you. So as your summer vegetables finish at the end of this coming summer, you're gonna clean everything up well. Uh, you, can con uh, you can consult the uh, soils class for how you prepare the garden for the next season, but you're gonna need to add fertilizer because these guys, these heavy feeders that you see up here, they will have exhausted your, your soil nutrition by the end of the summer. So you will uh, re-loosen um, your soil incorporate fertilizer, incorporate more compost if it's needed and get ready to plant all these wonderful vegetables that we grow in the cool season. A few general uh, uh, reminders from our other classes. Uh, please, in the, for the cool season, deal with snails and slugs. You know, they take kind of a vacation in the summer, but they come back uh, very strong in the uh, fall and uh, until it gets really cold, they're very active. So uh, Louise talked about how to deal with these last week. She was absolutely right that hand picking, searching them out and hand picking them, hunting at night or finding their hiding places during the day, that is the absolute best way to get the population down in your yard. The other um, pest that is you're probably seeing now in your gardens because we're getting to the end of the cool season is the aphids. And uh, there are so many different kinds that get on so many different plants. Uh, there's here's the black bean aphid on chard and the cabbage aphid over here on a brassica of some kind. And they are going to be terrible pests two times a year. Right now for about the next month or two they will be bothering you. And then when it gets hot, they'll, they'll get lost. And then in the late summer, when we plant our main cool season garden, aphids will show up as soon as it starts getting cool, a little cooler. They don't like the hot summer weather, but they'll come in the early fall and they will be pests for a while there. So you need to think, go back and look at what Louise did, talked about in terms of how you deal with these guys. Uh, and be ready to take action. 
some of you asked about uh, should should you destroy them when we know that good in good insects, that is predator insects, eat them or or parasitize them. Uh, and the answer is yes, because as she explained, you always have more pests than than um, than you have the predators that feed on them. So they can rapidly get out of hand and predators can't, predators and parasites can't necessarily get them back under control if you've let them got out of control. But, but it's certainly true that you shouldn't worry about destroying everyone because the uh, other insects can take care of a limited population and plan how you're gonna manage these guys. Okay, it, this is whether they're ones that you don't like to look at, like the one in the upper left, or ones that you love to look at, like the one in the lower right. Uh, these are all the vertebrate pests that can just play havoc with uh, any garden, cool season or warm season. So you need to think about how you're gonna manage them. And you uh, were given a lot of good ideas uh, last week in the IPM class. If you weren't part of that class, I highly recommend that you go back and watch that class in its entirety and pay attention to how to block these out. Um, they're going to be very, very busy in the spring and when, when you're planting the cool season vegetables because they're getting ready for winter or recovering from winter. So uh, they're going to be out there really wanting to eat everything you put in the garden. Okay, we're ready to start talking about the vegetables that you can plant uh, in the cool season garden. And um, this is one that is a real beauty spot in the garden. Uh, it's wonderful to have fresh lettuce in the garden. You can easily plant enough lettuce on a succession basis to keep yourself in salads really pretty much through the whole season. There, there will be a slow time in the coldest part of the winter uh, but in the, uh, in the fall and again in the spring, uh, lettuce will just be growing like crazy. So look at the planting chart. You can grow these from seed directly planted in the garden, or you can uh, plant seedlings and then keep growing your own seedlings so that you always have seedlings to plug in after you pick lettuce. Uh, there are, um, in the spring season, I would recommend that you look for quick growing varieties to plant in the spring season uh, and that you use seedlings rather than a direct seeding because that will give you that quick start that you need in order to get it in and get it out again before uh, it gets too hot for lettuce. Because lettuce, um, when it gets too hot, will rapidly um, end its life by doing what we call bolting. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. So how do we harvest lettuce? Um, lettuce can be harvested no matter whether it's head lettuce or leaf lettuce, it can be harvested, harvested leaf by leaf. So here you see somebody picking a, a leaf off and you take the oldest leaves from around the outside of the plant. If you, if you do this constantly, it will just keep making leaves and spreading and you can keep harvesting like this for a very, very, very long time. Uh, some of us like the mix of taste of uh, new lettuce leaves and older lettuce leaves because the flavor does change. And if you want, if you like that mix, then you might want to harvest the whole head. What I do in my garden is I plant the lettuce half the distance that is recommended. So let's say that for the variety you're growing, head lettuce is you're advised to plant, plant it a little farther apart, but let's say the distance that you're advised to plant it is 10 inches. I plant a head of lettuce every five inches. When they touch, I start harvesting every other head as a whole head. And when I've done all that, I go back to harvesting leaf by leaf if I wanna prolong the harvest. So you can do it either, either way. Either way is fine. Um, this is a, just a picture to show you how very big heads of lettuce can get. Uh, sometimes we don't see this happen because we crowd them too much, but this is a crisp head uh, of Batavian um, called Pablo that I grew in my garden and I just wanted to see how big it would get. And you can see there that it's about 14 inches wide. So if I had planted this every five inches, I would have never seen that it was capable of turning into this, this kind of a, a head of lettuce. 
So if you want full heads, you need to give it more room. If you're planting leaf by leaf, you can plant closer. And then there's this style of growing lettuce, which is called cut and come again lettuce. So here, uh, you can see there's sort of rows here. So this gardener planted in rows, but planted the rows very close together and just planted very thickly with the intention of cutting this lettuce, just kind of grabbing a handful of it and cutting it about an inch from where it enters the soil. Uh, and what you get is a handful of basically baby lettuce. So once the lettuce has grown to about four inches high, you do that. And you can see that by cutting successive rows, you can get that kind of baby lettuce salad mix this way. It doesn't have to be in rows. It can be just uh, broadcast into a, a, um, a full square in your garden too. And you can still cut it like this. You can usually do cut and come again. I think about probably the fourth time is getting a little dicey uh, in terms of whether the uh, plants will renew themselves. But if you have a large enough planting, you can cut half of it at a time or a third of it at a time. It's a nice way if you like that kind of uh, um, salad, the baby lettuce type of salad. Okay, this is the picture of bolting lettuce that I wanted to show you. Now you can see these lettuce plants are about two and a half or three feet tall here now. Um, and they were ordinary lettuce plants when they started. And while it might look to you like there's a lot of lettuce on those plants, I can assure you that it will not taste good. This is not lettuce that you are going to enjoy eating because when, when they started as regular heads, but at some point, the, the center of the lettuce starts to stretch out and you see a sort of a center stalk emerging and the leaves are stretching out along the stem as you see here. And it just keeps getting taller and taller. And actually these bolted to this height within about, um, I would say two to three weeks in hot weather. And when they do that, they're, go they're going to seed basically. This is what a lettuce plant does to go to seed. Here it is when it's actually gone to seed and you can see it's lost all its color. Basically all the energy from that plant has gone into these uh, fuzzy, uh, these are um, seeds with a little bit of fuzz on them so that they can fly in the wind and travel just like a dandelion seed. So these are the uh, flower stalks and seed heads that have formed on that same planting of lettuce. So when the plant is getting ready to do that, it's transferring all its energy into that stalk and into these, what is these flowers and seeds to come. So uh, it, it's moving material there also. So the, the lettuce becomes very bitter. If you snap, I'm sorry, I couldn't find, nobody has bolting lettuce yet this year that I could find. Um, but if you snap, the that center stalk and look at it, you'll see white, a uh, thick white sap forming on that broken stalk. And that is uh, called Latuca. It's where we get the um, genus name for lettuce, which is Latuca. Uh, and Latuca is very bitter. And that white sap is in all the leaves by that time, as well as in the stem. So the lettuce will not be good to eat at that point. So when you see it start to stretch out, just the very beginning of it, harvest your lettuce. Give it to friends, take it to the food bank, eat what you can. There is no point in letting it stay in the garden. Okay, here's another salad green that a lot of people can't uh, live without. So it's, I just want to mention, it's very, very easy to grow your own arugula. Um, there are different kinds. You can see two kinds here. The, uh, it is so easy to grow it from seed. There is no reason to grow transplants or to buy transplants. Get a pack of arugula seed and throw it out in the garden and it will grow. It does grow faster as the season heats up and it uh, will get hotter um, and uh, eventually bitter. So it's best to pick it young. Uh, and you can grow this cut and come again as well. Now, this is just a test. Uh, just think for a minute, what do you think, if you saw this in your box of lettuce, what would you think had eaten this lettuce? 
There are a number of potential culprits, but if you're going to keep it from happening, you really need to identify it correctly. So um, a lot of people, the first thing they go to is squirrels because we see squirrels running around. We see them messing with our plants. Uh, we know that they're, they can trash a plant in no time. Um, and it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to think, or it wouldn't be unjustified to think that it might be squirrels. But I think you would see if it were squirrels, you would see bigger leaves broken off. Uh, some people might think snails, but there's no sign of slime here. Uh, and those holes are ragged. Snail holes are not ragged. They are pretty neatly chewed and you would see the slime. So this is damage done by birds. Those lovely, wonderful little <coughs> birds that are raising baby birds and that we're so excited about, but they love lettuce and peas and they can destroy them very quickly. So this is what bird damage looks like. So remember this if you have a problem with your lettuce and uh, ask yourself whether it might be birds. Birds can be kept out with bird netting as well as with the kind of cages that you saw uh, in the IPM class last week. Uh, you do have to prepare yourself if you use bird netting. Oh, oh and also row cover uh, will work to protect from birds. They generally, if they don't see it, they won't go after it, unlike rats. More on that later. Um, so you could protect with that. If you decide to use bird netting, uh, do be aware that birds do sometimes get caught in bird netting and it, it's uh, a horrible uh, experience to have to uh, try to free a frantic bird and it's even worse to free one that hasn't made it. Okay, I mentioned peas as being favorites of birds and uh, indeed they are. These are, I think, sugar snap peas, but it's hard to tell at this stage that they, they kind of look like sugar snap peas. They might be shelling peas that aren't quite full yet. Um, but uh, we have three kinds. They're all the same genus and species. They're just um, breeders have developed three different kinds. We have snow peas, which are the ones that we pick as flat pods where the seeds haven't developed at all. Sugar snap peas, where we pick the pod when the peas are still in it before it gets too fat, but when it's already puff, you know, uh, uh, um, nicely uh, filled out and we eat the pod along with the peas inside. And then shelling peas, which we allow the peas inside to develop fully, but not too fully. Uh, it's a shame to let them go too far. Uh, and by that time, the pod has gotten somewhat thinner and you can break the pot open and shell the peas out. So we have all three kinds, all three grow wonderfully. Uh, there is a, um, they are very subject, I'll show you a picture later, to powdery mildew. And many of us find that we have an easier time with them in the fall with regard to powdery mildew than in the spring. And I will explain that when I show you the picture about powdery mildew. Um, protect them from birds when they are coming up that's when birds go after peas. So many times people think their peas never germinated and came up. They're easy to plant from seed. So you don't need to grow seedlings and put them in the ground. If you do grow seedlings or buy seedlings, be very careful with the root ball when you plant them because it's, it's easily, uh, the roots are, are uh, succulent and easily broken. So, uh, but easy, super easy to plant from seed. And if you do that, cover them up with something so that birds will not see them emerging. Birds will see them emerging sooner than you do and they nip them off right at the soil line and you won't ever know that they came up if you haven't been watching carefully. Okay, um, this is one thing to know about all peas, whether they're the tall kind or what they call bush peas or shorter peas, uh, they all, are viney and tend to tangle with each other and collapse uh, from their own weight, especially once they start setting fruit. Um, but uh, they support themselves with these tendrils. They don't wind around things like pole beans do. They make these separate little structures, tendrils, 
that uh, will wave around and catch onto anything that they bump up against. And you can see how tightly they curl on. And this is how the vine holds itself upright. So you wanna put something in your planting that will hold it up. And this is true even for the shorter ones. You can use fruit tree prunings or, or any kind of uh, twiggy pruning uh, to stick that in the ground with all its branches sticking around and just put it in amongst your peas and they will grab onto that. Or you can use something like, uh, this is hog fencing, or you can use concrete reinforcing wire, uh, like many of you probably use for tomato cages. You can use that uh, to grow peas on uh, in the uh, cool season. So here's a picture of powdery mildew. And the one on the left is showing it when it's just starting. This is the main problem that we have with peas. Um, it's just starting. So you see the individual little colonies that are starting there of that fungus. Powdery mildew is an is a interesting fungus. It's airborne. So it's, when it's existing on anybody's plants, it means it's blowing around everywhere. Uh, this is why it's very hard to keep it out of your garden, no matter what you do, because it keeps coming in with air currents. And uh, it um, is uh, favored by warm days, cool nights. Now, when do we have warm days and cool nights? We have them at the end of the summer when the days are still quite warm, but already because sun is setting sooner, the nights are getting somewhat cooler. So that's why we get powdery mildew with such a vengeance in the late summer on our cucumbers and squashes and so forth. The other time that we have that climate condition is in the spring when the days are warming up like this last few days are a wonderful example. The days are starting to be warm, but the nights are still quite cool. So that's again, the type of weather in which powdery mildew is, uh, it's very easy for it to take hold. So um, in the spring, if you plant your peas in the spring and you plant them early, like February or early March, you're gonna have quite a long season of powdery mildew to fight with. But if you plant them in early September, the days will be cooling down faster. I know it's, it can vary from year to year. So there is a little bit of just blind luck involved in this. But if you always get powdery mildew on your peas in the spring, try planting them in the fall and see if it works any better in your garden. The picture on the right shows a real infestation. Now, if, you're, if you have a plant that ends up looking like this, you are not doing your garden a favor by allowing that to persist in your garden because it's just growing powdery mildew to spread around your garden. So if something gets that covered with it, take it out. There are all kinds of um, homegrown remedies for powdery mildew. And the really fun thing about this uh, fungus, this particular fungus, another unusual thing, is that it can't reproduce in the presence of, of water. And most fungi are very much favored by water, by, by their being wet, wet conditions. But this one is not. So if you, if you hear, oh, I've heard that if you put milk and water and spray it on your plants, it'll slow down powdery mildew. Well, it might slow it down, but it's the water, not the milk that's doing it. And um, you can use fungicides, but then you have a fungicide all over your plant that you want to eat. You can use oils, including neem oil, to uh, treat it once it's there. Uh, but again, then you have oil all over uh, your plant. Um, and any oil that is uh, rated for use on plants, any uh, lightweight oil, uh, a very highly refined oil like superior oil or supreme oil, those are the ones that you want to use on, on, on this. And it, if you get it in the early stages, you may be able to knock it out. But um, it, as I said, it's in the air. It's very persistent. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a, a battle trying to keep it off your plants. Um, oh, I should say one more thing about that before I go on to chart here. 
Um, and that is that good air circulation in the garden is a really helpful thing for almost all fungal diseases. So good air circulation will help the plants dry off quickly so that the fungi that are favored by uh, moisture on the plants will not be able to uh, continue. And uh, good air, air circulation is just in general good for the health of the plant. So uh, don't crowd your plants too much. Okay, this is one of my favorite vegetables and I'm sort of on a mission to get everybody to grow chard. For one thing, chard that you grow in your garden and you harvest and you bring in, if you've only eaten grocery store chard, you won't believe how different it can be. Uh, it's also one of the most beautiful things that we can grow in the cool season garden. Look at those colors. My, it turns out that my favorite chard is a white stemmed chard, but uh, it is very hard to resist all these beautiful colors. And it is, this is, it says harvest of the month. I found this online uh, it, from another master gardener program. It can be harvested every month of the year from the same plant. So if you plant, it's a biennial. If you plant chard, in March, in February or March, if you plant well-started seedlings in February or March, because they're a biennial, they will not go to seed until they have been through a cold season. And their next cold season is gonna be the following winter. So if you plant them in, in February or March, and then we're in spring and it warms up and it's summer and they're still growing and producing like crazy, and then it's fall, and then it's December and now they're finally getting in a cold season, they won't start to bolt and make seed until the following February or March. So you get the most amazing harvest from just a half a dozen charred plants. So I urge you to try it if you have never tried it. You harvest this by pulling off the outer leaves. Uh, we generally tell people, and that you'll see this in, um, in books, gardening books, to um, carefully break off the leaf from the bottom. Tear it like with a kind of a twisting motion with your hand right at the bottom where it, it's attached to the plant so that uh, you don't leave a stub. Uh, there are people though, I have to tell you, who cut it and have never seen any problem with cutting it. The theory is that the stubs might be able to rot and the rot might move back down into the main stem of the plant. But um, I know a lot of wonderful gardeners who uh, harvest their chard that way and they don't have any problem. You can harvest this chard, like this, this chard has not been harvested for a long time. You can harvest it down to uh, four leaves, take everything else off the outer leaves, take them, keep harvesting the outer leaves and you will be amazed at how, play, how quickly chard replaces those uh, removed leaves. Uh, it's just an incredibly productive plant. Uh, by the way, the ribs are edible. They have to be cooked differently because they are a little bit more solid than those leaves, um, but they're uh, a delicacy in France, apparently. No, in France? Yes, in France, uh, one of our master gardeners discovered that the French throw away the green part and only use the ribs. And she had to be on a mission to get them to use the ribs and uh, uh, to use the green part as well as the ribs. But here, a lot of people throw away that stem and it's actually very succulent and delicious. Just you need to cook it a little differently. This, you, if you grow chard and maybe if you grow beets, you may have seen your leaves turning into something that looks like this and wondered what on earth was going on there. This is a insect called a leaf miner. And leaf miner, there are a lot of insects that are leaf miners. It's a lifestyle, not, not really a, a single insect. It's a, it's a way that they live. It describes a way that they live. A, a leaf miner can be a beetle or a fly, um, uh, or there's another, another kind. Uh, too, but um, they um, lay their egg on the leaf of a plant that is their host. This one happens to be a fly, and it's about as small as a fruit fly. It's smaller than a fruit fly, I believe, so you, you will never even see these little flies um, or be able to recognize them. It lays its egg on this leaf, and when the egg hatches, the larva, the little teeny, teeny larva, because the egg is very tiny, uh, eats its way in between the tissues of the leaf. 
and it wiggles or just moves around between the upper and lower tissues of the leaf, eating the material that's in between. And so basically that's what's happened here. The, the, the two layers, the bottom layer and the upper layer of the leaf are left. It looks like a blister because what's in between has been eaten. And the larva is in there. In fact, I think it's possible that this is a larva, but I, I wouldn't swear to it. But when you have it happen in your garden, you can definitely see the larva in the mines um, eating away at your plants. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't harvest this leaf and eat everything except this ugly part. So you could take it, when you see that kind of damage, I'm going to get to that in a minute, uh, you should pick that leaf immediately because if that larva finishes its life cycle, it will turn into an adult, it will pupate, come out as an adult and be there to lay more eggs on your charge so that the cycle continues. This is why we tell you not to take these leaves off and throw them in your compost because this insect can finish its life cycle in your compost unless it's well buried and it's hot. So um, it would be better to take it into the kitchen, cut out the spoiled part and eat this leaf and get rid of that part in a plastic bag in the trash or you can put it in the if you put it in the city compost, if you know that the pickup is the next day, but even that's a little risky, I actually put my uh, bad parts down the garbage disposal. So I don't have to worry about this insect finishing its life cycle. And these are the eggs. Uh, now you may not be patient enough to do that, this, but this is what I do. I actually examine my chard when I know leaf miners are active. When I start to see the very first little signs of damage, I sit in the garden with a cup of tea and I turn over the leaves of my chard and I look for these eggs. And I think this picture should convince you, you can see them because even though they're incredibly tiny, this is a thumbnail that you see in the lower, lower left of the picture. Even though they're incredibly tiny, they're so bright white and they're on this dark green leaf. So they definitely stick out. And if you see those and rub them off before they hatch, uh, you will have ended that, that many lives of leaf miner and avoided that much damage. So if you have the patience to do that, there's a, a very non-toxic method of controlling leaf miner. Uh, the, otherwise, uh, don't let that damage sit there in your garden. Know that that is a nursery for the insect and it will just, its population will just build and build. Uh, if you allow it to persist there. There really isn't anything you can spray to take care of leaf miner because of the fact that that hatched insect gets inside the leaf so quickly. And aphids love chard. So um, chard is one of the vegetables you wanna watch and take care of. And again, we talked a lot about methods for taking care of aphids, washing them off, uh, you can use insecticidal soap. Uh, you can go back and look at the IPM class for more tips on aphids or look at the IPM site. Lots of good cultural tips there on how to try to control aphids, keep them at a manageable level. All right, I'm going to go on to spinach because I put it next to chard, even though it's not related. Uh, actually, it is related to chard. Beets, spinach, and chard are all in the same family. And um, this is a wonderful vegetable to grow in the, in the cool season. Um, so uh, it grows in the coldest months when other things are very sluggish, this will grow really quickly. Uh, and therefore, because it tends to grow mostly in cool weather, aphids and leaf miners pretty much aren't a problem on it. Uh, they'll only be a problem if you put it in too early. This is one of the things you can plant the latest. So I hold off, plant it later, and um, look, look it up in the planting chart and know that you can get a wonderful crop of spinach. Uh, rats are very fond of spinach. You do need to pre protect it from rats. And then uh, the other uh, green of the moment is kale. And these are just two of the very popular varieties, but there are other varieties um, out there that are also wonderful. Um, and this is a, another, uh, this is part of the big group of brassicas. So now we're moving away from 
beets, chard, spinach. We'll talk about beets later with root vegetables. Um, uh, this is a um, in the brassica family, same family as bro broccoli, cauliflower, um, turnips. Uh, there are many, many of our winter family, uh, winter vegetables come from this family. So spacing will affect the size of the plant, but you're gonna be picking these leaves off constantly to eat them. Again, you're gonna pick the lower, lower leaves. You can see here, somebody breaking off uh, the lower leaf. <clears throat> And you can again, pick it down quite dramatically to just leaving five or six leaves there at the top and uh, keep picking every single week. Uh, and this shows what it ends up looking like. The stem kind of goes up bare, but the leaves keep coming as the plant grows up. Aphids love kale. What can I say? Aphids love a lot of things, but again, uh, early in the season and late in the season, but in between you should get a lot of good kale out of the garden. Uh, there, I'm going to go quickly just show you some other greens here. There are a lot of mustards that you can grow. Um, the smaller, the younger and smaller the leaves are when you pick them, the milder uh, and less bitter they will be. But the, those tastes of a spicy and a little bit of bitter are some uh, tastes that we also like. So these are two, some varieties that you can grow. This shows how big those leaves can get. And I, I, I can tell you that's not gonna be mild, um, but uh, they do get quite impressive in the garden and it's fun to, really fun to grow them. Uh, and then there are so many Asian greens uh, that we can grow. They grow quickly and very well in our climate. So here you see the very familiar bok choy, sort of a bait picked at the baby stage, or maybe it was a baby plant. And on the right is edible chrysanthemum that um, many of you may not know about, but that's a, another um, green, Asian green. Here's a picture of a bok choy on the, a bok choy on the right uh, on, that is uh, huge uh, compared to those babies. Um, you can see these vegetables grow so fast and so well in our climate. And these, are, these others are pictures of other Asian vegetables that uh, are grown by some of our master gardener friends. Okay, quickly to broccoli. Um, broccoli is uh, not a, we don't eat the leaves and uh, we instead eat the flower head. This is the actual, the buds of the flowers, probably all know that. And uh, this is uh, sort of the queen of the uh, brassica family, I think you would say. Uh, it's quite a large plant. Some of them are larger than others. So you wanna look at what size uh, when you buy your seeds or you buy your seedlings, you want to take a look if you need a smaller plant. Uh, they can be grown in containers, but this is one that would take a pretty, pretty large container. Uh, so uh, the bigger the plant, the bigger the container. The big message on broccoli, they take a, a long time to produce, but you can get some that will produce in seven to 10 weeks. So you will be eating them in the fall. Others take much longer. They might take, um, um, uh, the seven to 10 weeks is a long one, sorry, that's a long one. So up to 70 days to get something and you might not ever uh, get them until uh, the spring. But there are some that are shorter days. And so um, you can go for shorter season uh, varieties if you wanna try to have broccoli in the fall. Otherwise, get it in early toward the very early part of that planting time. Um, and I hope that all of you know that once you cut that um, head, that center head, broccoli sprouts. So you can see here a little head of broccoli, a little uh, sprout of broccoli coming from each one of the leaf axles after the center head has been cut. And if you cut those, more will come other places on the leaf stalks of the plant. And you can be literally harvesting it for weeks and weeks this way. Do not wait for that center head to get to some pre-imagined size. Uh, it won't necessarily get to the size that you have in mind. And if it starts to spread, um, you will be losing quality uh, very quickly in that. So cut it when it's still really tight. If it's not enlarging anymore, uh, take it no matter what size it is and know that you're gonna get a lot of side shoots that you can pick for weeks and weeks. Do not in any case let any of this happen. So here on the, uh, oops, sorry. 
on the left is a broccoli head that is starting to spread. And I'm guessing that this was smaller than the person thought it should be. And they waited and waited and then it started the individual section started to spread out. And as I said, it, it, the quality goes down then. And uh, here it's actually starting to flower and it will keep spreading out until it's a big spray of, of uh, yellow flowers like the mustard flowers, uh, which is in the same family. So don't let that happen. Pick it when it's still tight. And remember, aphids love broccoli. This is a recurring theme. Um, and uh, that is uh, a very difficult thing to deal with. I always tell people my solution to aphids on broccoli is lots of fresh cracked black pepper in the dish so that people think they're eating pepper. Now, these are also members of the same family. You can see they're very similar. The, the slightly out of focus picture of cauliflower on the left, I kept in because I want you to see how big that cauliflower plant is. And a cauliflower plant is a one and done. So cauliflower does not sprout from the leaf axils. Once you cut that head, it's finished. So if that is a, that's a normal size head of cauliflower, probably about six inches wide. So think how wide that whole plant is. It's more than three feet wide. And so you need to give it that much space in order to develop that big head. If you only get small heads on your cauliflower, ask yourself how far apart you're planting your cauliflower. How much space are you giving it in the garden? It needs at least three square feet, three by th nine square feet, three by three in order to reach its full size. So you have to decide if the, it's worth that space for that one head of cauliflower. They certainly are spectacular, as you can see here, all the colors that are available now. Romanesco up top is a, uh, another type um, of vegetable, very similar, same family. Um, very, very beautiful to see in the garden. Also one head and done, although sometimes you can steal a few uh, uh, sections from the bottom and it will keep producing, but um, that's a little iffy. And here's a picture of cauliflower when it's gone by. So you can see how it just spreads out and you can see how all those individual things are gonna burst into being little flowers uh, quite shortly. And they, quite shortly, and they, they are uh, not in, uh, it is not as tasty a vegetable when it gets to this stage. Okay, main, I wanted to say something about the main uh, pests of uh, the broccoli family because so many of our plants are in that family. This goes for kale and kohlrabi and, and, uh, and um, broccoli and cauliflower and, um, every, and even mustards, although these pests don't seem to bother mustards as much. So that white butterfly that you see fluttering around your, your garden at certain times of the year, the one with the little black spot on its wings is the imported cabbage butterfly. It lays eggs that look like um, this uh, on the underside of your um, uh, broccoli family vegetables, always on the underside so that they're protected. And they hatch into worms that look like this, into caterpillars that look like this. There, here's a blow up of it. It's a velvety looking thing. It likes to align itself on veins because it's harder to see that way, but this one's very large. You can imagine when they come out of this egg, they're very, very small. When they're very small, they make very small holes. And when they're this size, they make very large scalloped uh, you know, chewed places and they can destroy a plant if you don't keep them in check. The good news is you can see them and you can hand pick them off even when they're small. If you're um, careful and watchful and willing to go out there uh, frequently, when those butterflies are active, you can uh, keep these guys under control. You can even train yourself to see these eggs because of the color contrast again, and you can brush them off. They just look like a whisker, uh, just a, like a little whisker sticking up on the leaf and you can brush those off. And, uh, but you have to be thorough and look down into the center of the plant because they will sometimes hide in there. Uh, but if you see holes appearing uh, in your brassica family, suspect this pest and do what you can to control it. I'll show you chemical controls in a minute. 
This is another caterpillar that's called the cabbage looper, but in my garden, it's more of a pest on lettuce. Um, but it is the inchworm uh, type of caterpillar. And um, this is its moth, which you will not see because it's night flying. And that's its egg. And I find those very difficult to see, whereas the other one is easy to see. So I'm not sure why that's true, but maybe that one's a bit smaller. So both of these are uh, pests, as is this guy. This is a cutworm. This is the larva of a moth, a night flying moth that lays its eggs in the soil and they live in the soil below the plant at night, at night. They come out, they crawl up the stem and they will chew off the stem. Sometimes they chew it off right at the ground level. Um, but they also go up in the plant and chew on the leaves or chew off leaf stalks. These are all cutworms I found working on our broccoli in um, our demonstration garden uh, early this, uh, when was that? Late last fall, like, or last fall. Uh, and um, they live in the soil during the day. So if you uh, disturb the soil around your plants during the day, you will, you may find these guys, just crush them if you do. Uh, they are a, a pest, just smash them. Don't mistake them for these guys. Uh, a lot of people send us questions about these because they find them when they're digging in their compost pile or they find them when they're digging in their garden beds. These are not plant pests. They are turf grass pests. This is what uh, skunks and raccoons are looking for when they tear up your, your turf. But sometimes by accident, they're, they're, um, the eggs that lead into these are laid in our compost piles and or in our uh, garden beds. Um, but they don't, they don't do much damage there. Uh, in fact, I don't think they do any damage there. And they are called white grubs. So um, they are the grub uh, of a beetle. Um, so they, but not a plant pest. Feed them to birds. If you find them in your beds, dig them out, feed them to birds. Okay, if you cannot bring yourself to hand pick caterpillars off your uh, brassica plants, um, or you just don't have time to do that, there, these two products are uh, sprays that will kill caterpillars. Uh, BT only kills caterpillars. Um, and Spinosad will also kill thrips and flies. They're both approved for use in, in organic farms and gardens. And like any pesticide, as Louise told you last week, be sure you follow the directions exactly and you read that whole label so you know exactly what to do, how much to apply, when to apply, how often to apply. Uh, just a picture of kohlrabi because it's such a wonderful vegetable. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's a brassica and it's a wonderful one and it's worth growing in your garden just because it just looks so great sitting there. Um, yeah, and the leaves are delicious. The leaves are like kale, um, even better than kale, a lot of us think. So uh, you can eat some leaves. And um, I thought I better mention Brussels sprouts since we're in Brussels sprouts territory, but I am running out of time. So the main thing about Brussels sprouts is that um, these guys take four to five months to form. You have to plant the seedlings in July. And then they grow all the way from July into the fall and you're lucky if you get them in the fall, you might not get them till the spring. So this is, if, you're, if you've ever tried to grow them and you haven't uh, been successful, uh, just be aware that um, you're not alone. <laughs> a lot of us have tried and have not been successful. Um, and a lot of it has to do with planting time. You must get these seedlings in the ground in July. And that's when you want to be growing tomatoes and squash and cucumbers. So uh, probably not a lot of you are, are going to be willing to do that. And not only that, but aphids love sprouts too. And a lot of us have given up on sprouts because of the difficulty of keeping aphids off the Brussels sprouts plants because they are in there at, in the late summer when aphids uh, come in for that a start of the cool season. And they're still in there usually in the spring when the aphids come back. So it's very difficult to control aphids on Brussels sprouts. 
Uh, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna fly through some root vegetables. Uh, these are a lot of these, pic some of these pictures, these are from Karen who uh, taught you the first class and will teach you the last class. And Karen is the root vegetable queen in my book. She raises the most beautiful root vegetables. This is just to show you root vegetables grow out of the ground and they still have long roots. On the right, you can see that long root that went down into the ground. But a lot of that edible root comes out of the ground. If you pick leaves to eat beet greens, uh, you can steal some leaves before the root is ready to pick, but it will affect the final size of your beet. So um, do be careful about that. Spacing is key for all roots. That is the one thing to take home. If you haven't been able to go uh, and, and, and nicely worked loose soil, if you haven't been able to grow carrots or turnips or even radishes or beets, I, it's nine times out of 10, it's because you did not thin them to the right spacing. They simply will not form that root if they aren't spaced properly. So that gigantic rutabaga on the left, you can see there uh, how much of it was out of the ground before it was picked. And these turnips are out of the ground and the carrots don't so much grow out of the ground, but the rest of the root vegetables do. So spacing, follow the directions for spacing uh, and you will have success. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to pull a full grown root out of the ground. Cool season containers, as I said, virtually everything can be grown in containers, match the size of the plant to the size of the container. Even though you can try growing in shallow containers, everything will grow better in deeper containers. So use the largest containers that you can possibly put together for your container vegetables. All the things that we talked about in the soils class about renewing the potting soil, uh, you don't have to put totally fresh every year, but you do have to renew it at least a, uh, a, maybe a third of it every year. And every once in a while, start to totally fresh. Fertilizing and water for, um, cool, uh, for cool season vegetables isn't quite such a race because the weather is uh, cooler, but you still have to be just as careful about watering because they are limited to what you're giving them in that container. So be careful about fertilizing and watering your container vegetables. Here are uh, some more just to show you anything can be grown uh, like this spinach, chard, beets, and uh, carrots being shown here. Okay, um, uh, we have not covered all the full, uh, uh, cool season vegetables as you can see. Our website is loaded with them, and that's why we want so much for you to become familiar with this website. Here's the page on artichokes. It's full of information about growing artichokes and links to even more information about growing artichokes. Uh, okay, that is uh, basically it. Um, I'm going to leave this up here. For those of you that have been faithfully doing our little assignments, uh, this is what we would like you to do for next week, and I'll leave it up here while we're taking questions. Uh, but we want you to go back to that IPM website. We want you to find the page on tomatoes, and it tells you how to do it there. We want you to look at the incredibly long list of diseases, pests, and environmental disorders that affect tomatoes. You'll wonder how, how anybody ever gets a tomato when you look at the length of that list. And pick one of them maybe one that you think you has been bothering your tomatoes and read the information on it. This is to get you familiar with going into that website, looking up something that's happening in your garden and seeing if you can solve your own problem. Phew, I know I have eaten up most of our time, but we do have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> yes, we've got, we've got some questions coming in. So, so there were several questions about shade. So people are dealing with small yards. Um, one person, her house casts a shadow. Other people have fences and trees. Any, any vegetables that can be grown with less sun in the winter? Uh, less sun possibly, but not less than six hours maybe four hours. Maybe arugula will grow with four hours of sun. 
um, but uh, less than six, no. It, this is a very sad fact of a gardener's life in suburbia. We all have these problems, if not from our own trees and our own house, from our neighbor's house and our neighbor's trees. Uh, so it, it is, uh, you have my sympathies. I have the problem too. I've had to move my garden, entire garden because of a tree growing uh, and overshadowing my backyard, original backyard garden. So uh, you simply have to get clever about uh, what you grow, grow smaller varieties so that they will fit in the bit of sun that you have. If you try to grow leafy greens, um, particularly let's say lettuce might be the easiest one to try to grow with not enough sun, it will simply grow very slowly. If you use containers, if you can put them in containers and move them into areas that get more sun, that would be better than putting them in an area that only gets a few hours of sun a day in the ground. And then a, a kind of a, another question, can cool season vegetables be planted in the shade in April, May? So there were several questions about whether or not I can plant broccoli. Um, you know, can I, can I go, so some of these cool season vegetables, can we grow them through the summer? Uh, there are some cool season vegetables that you can grow through the summer, and I encourage you to just experiment with it. What you will find is that many of them will start to bolt. Okay, so lettuce will bolt, uh, broccoli will bolt, bolt, even chard, if it's been in for a year, it will bolt. If it hasn't been in, if you plant it at this spring, it won't bolt. Uh, but if you plant it at the previous fall, it will bolt. Um, spinach will bolt. Most of them will bolt, but you can try. So as long as it's not bolting, you can keep it in and see how long you can protect it. But again, I wanna go back to the question about, can you keep them longer if you put them in the shade? It's not, it's not a temperature thing, it's a sunlight thing. Sunlight is the energy that drives plants. Without it, they can't photosynthesize. So that's why planting them in the shade, you know, keeping them cooler is nice. You could put, if you, if you have them in a sunny spot, you could put row cover over them so that they don't get quite such blasting sun and see if that helps you extend their life, their life a bit. Uh, but putting them in the shade, that is where they actually don't get sun, that, that will not help. They will simply stop growing. Okay. And then a follow-up question on row cover. Um, how long can you leave row cover on plants if you're protecting them from hot weather? Um, if you're protecting them from hot weather, uh, you can leave them, you can actually grow plants under row cover. I showed you that one picture of it and uh, it's designed to do that. So there are organic farmers who grow some of their produce under row cover from the moment they plant it till the mo moment they're finished, they're ready to harvest the whole thing. Of course, they're harvesting everything at once and, they, and it's not such a a burden for them, whereas we want to keep getting in there and getting out of there uh, as we harvest things over a long period. Uh, but you can you can leave it under the row cover for in its entire lifetime. But but wouldn't the row cover? Somebody asked, wouldn't the row cover increase the inside temperature for the plant on it, a hot it, day? It, it it doesn't really increase the inside. You saw that it it gives you about four degrees of protection. It doesn't build up in there because it's not airtight. Row cover is not airtight. Water goes through it. It's porous. So it, it is, the heat will not build up in there. It might raise the temperature by a degree or two, but not more than that. So it'll be all right. If you're worried about it, you can go out and just lift it up until the very, very hot days pass and then, um, and then put it back down if you're using it for pest protection. Great. And then when the planting chart shows the planting season spans several months, for example, arugula, you can plant from February to May, what month, how do you determine what month would be optimal? Um, any of the time that is shown there is a good time to plant. As you get toward the ends, you can be thinking about your own microclimate. So for example, uh, I said up here and when, when uh, we first developed the um, planting chart, uh, we, we talked about 
vegetables in Palo Alto and vegetables in San Jose and vegetables in South County. And we, that's why there's some question marks on that chart. So we tried to mark specifically the months that were, this is okay time to plant. Now let's say it says you can plant this in February and we have a cold spell in February like we haven't had in five years. Then you have to be uh, thoughtful about that and say, you know what? I know I'm supposed to be able to plant this in February, but it's been freezing the last five days. I think I'm gonna wait. And so you need to think about that um, at, when you're near the edges of the planting uh, window in that chart. And then Leanne, maybe we'll take this as the last one. Leanne says her kale is starting to make flowers. <laughs> Should she harvest it? <laughs> um, yes, uh, technically you should have harvested it before it started to make flowers. But uh, if you harvest it now, I think you can do a great experiment, which is you can harvest it and eat some of it and see what you think compared to how it tasted when you were harvesting it when it was a younger plant. Uh, because as I said, the plant starts, when it's making flowers, it's focused on survival and making seeds and it starts moving everything that's important into the flowers and into the seeds. So um, it, it, sim it, it doesn't taste as good. So uh, now if you don't notice any difference between the way it's tasted all winter and the way it's tasting now as it's going to flower, then that means that whatever that is I'm tasting, you don't taste, or maybe that variety doesn't have the problem. The one, the variety you're growing doesn't have that problem. So, uh, but I wouldn't, I would make an experiment of it. Yeah. And speaking of experiments, I can't help but say that Anne noticed that lettuce sown in October works great, but the birds think they're in for a great treat when she grows it in the spring. So yeah. Some of your seasonality depends on the critters living in your yard. That is absolutely, that is absolutely true. And that's one of, that was one of the reasons I said that some of us find that that's true for diseases too. Some of us find we have less trouble with powdery mildew on peas in the fall. Probably others find more problem with, uh, with it in the fall. So you, you do need to kind of uh, look at uh, the information that you can get on the web and then compare it to your experience in your garden and see what your conditions might be doing uh, to the situation. Well, thank you so much, Candace. That's all the time we have for tonight. So please see the Santa Clara County Master Gardener website for additional information about growing vegetables, links to our help desk, our online plant clinic and handouts related to this course. I wanna thank Candace again for a terrific presentation. And I wanna thank our team behind the scenes for answering a bunch of your questions. Thank you, Karen, Lisa, and Louise. Um, we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place for session seven, warm season vegetables. Meanwhile, take care, stay safe and happy gardening. <laughs>